Are you ready? This time next week, people will be enjoying a Thanksgiving dinner complete with turkey and cranberry sauce. And preparing that meal for some families during the pandemic is a financial challenge. That's where nonprofits like Adventist Community Services steps in. ABC 3340's Maya Johnson joins us from there right now. And Maya, how many boxes did they distribute to those in need today? Brenda, volunteers just told me they were officially able to pack 300 boxes with all the items needed for a happy holiday meal. The line actually just slowed down and they're still pulling out some food here. Volunteers tell me this opportunity is what God called them to do. Some folks, if they don't get this, they won't get nothing. It was a busy action-packed day for these volunteers as they prepared to lend a helping hand so that no one goes hungry this Thanksgiving. You're helping yourself and you're helping everybody. They won't have nothing. So a lot of folks can't go to the grocery store. They don't have nothing. But this help, if they do get something, just add on to what they got with the Lord's help. Volunteers say when they sit at their own table next Thursday, being thankful will hit them differently. To know that someone else that has come on this parking lot is sitting at that table and being thankful also for the food that we have given out to them. Because maybe if we was not here to do this service, they would not have a meal on their table. The director of community development says a lot of people are still hurting during this pandemic. Their mission is to be a blessing to a family and help tackle food insecurities in the community. To go back to their jobs where they're making minimum wage to provide child care, to keep to pay their rent, and to keep food on the pay table is absolutely impossible. And they did run into a little challenge getting food this year due to food shortages at food banks, but volunteers told me they are just happy to know they were able to put food on tables. Live in Birmingham, Maya Johnson, ABC 3340 News.
in my life as we look at the words I am uh, uh, he has been uh, for me my bread I tell you that I, I've not always had money but I've had bread uh, he, he has been my transportation I've not always had a car to drive but he always got me where I needed to go he's also taught me I, I didn't know everything that was on every test I ever took but the Lord made sure I knew enough to pass and so I want to thank God this morning for blessing me, and you ought to thank God this morning uh, for blessing you. You ought to lift up your head uh, uh, to the Lord. You ought to lift up your heart. I know you might be going through something. I know you might be dealing with something, but you need to rewind what God has done for you in the past. And if you'll do that, you'll begin to feel better today knowing that whatever it is that you're dealing with right now, since God has worked some stuff out in the past, you know that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's going to work it out in the present. And whatever you go through, he's going to work it out in the future today. So you ought to be happy and thankful. It ought to be some praise in your house today. It ought to be some praise when you're at your job. It ought to be some praise when you're in your car. Why? Because of what the Lord has done. Ought to be some praise in your heart because of what the Lord has done. I, 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 I want encourage, to encourage saints you to give. I just believe that God's going to give us the money to clean this church. I just believe that. God has been doing some minor miracles. I'm not going to steal uh, Elder McKnight's thunder on some stuff that God is doing. But God is blessing us during this pandemic. God is moving this church program forward. It's difficult, but anything that's worth doing is going to be difficult. If it was easy, we might need to consider whether we ought to be doing it or not. But because it's difficult, we can know that God is behind it. And so we want to encourage you. We want to encourage you to be at prayer meeting. Prayer meeting is not for the people who are play, who are putting on the service. Prayer meeting is for those saints who need prayer. And everybody who's a saint of God needs prayer. Amen? 
Amen. So I'm gonna, that's all my salutations and congratulations and exhortations and adulations. And now it's time to get to the word. The word of the Lord this morning will come from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Normally, if you were here and soon in, in, the, in months coming, you will be here. Uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, uh, and you need to stand if you're able, stand if you want to, stand if you desire to, stand if you want to give God some glory and some praise. You ought to stand in honor of the word of God. I'm going to do something different than I normally do. I'm going to read a text that's not really a part of the text I'm preaching today. I'm going to look at verses 11 through 13 because I want you to hear. Uh, 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 they were talking in Sabbath school today about clapping back at people. And I want, I want, I want. I want you to hear Paul clap back here today. I, Paul has some stuff he had to say to some folk. Let, 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 folk were challenging Paul, and Paul clapped back. I'm going to read 11 through 13, and I'm going to go back and read the text of emphasis. Here's what Paul says. He says, you made, me a, you made me act like a fool. You ought to be writing commendations for me. I'm, I'm, I'm in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm, I'm in verse 11. Let me read it again. You have made me act like a fool. You ought to be writing commendations for me. I'm in a New Living Translation. For I am not at all inferior to these super apostles, even though I'm nothing at all. When I was with you, I certainly gave you proof that I am an apostle. For I patiently did many signs and wonders and miracles among you. The only thing I failed to do, which I do in the other churches, was to become a financial burden to you. Please forgive me for this wrong. Can you hear the sarcasm? The sarcasm in his, in his, in his writing? Now let's go back up here to the, to the first part of the text here. And I'm going to read something here. I'm going to read, I'm going to read you here uh, what Paul's uh, uh, included. I'm going to, I'm going to go to, to verse 2. He said, I was caught up in the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside my body. But I do know that I was caught up to paradise and heard things so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words. Things no human is allowed to tell. That experience is worth boasting about. But I'm not going to do it. I will only boast in my weaknesses. If I wanted to boast, I would be no fool in doing so because I would be telling the truth. But I won't do it because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message, even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God. So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and to keep me from becoming proud. Here is verse 8. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So our topic this morning is humble superstar. Humble superstar. Lord, if there was anything that the church needed now, it is humility. None of us are more, none of us are as humble as we should be. And so, Lord, we pray that as this message is conveyed, that this weak servant your worst servant you've ever had will not botch this message today. Lord, speak to your people about the issue of humility. Not because I'm standing here, but in spite of the fact that I'm standing here. In every moment that I stand, let it be in your power. In Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord wherever you are, humble superstar. There, there was a man who had nothing for his family to eat. He had an old rifle and three bullets. So he decided that he would go out hunting and kill some wild game for dinner. As he went down the road, he saw a rabbit. He shot the rabbit. He shot at the rabbit, rather, and he missed it. The rabbit ran away. Then he saw a squirrel, and he fired a shot at the squirrel, and he missed it. The squirrel disappeared in a hole in a cottonwood tree. He, as he went further, he saw a large wild tom turkey in a tree, but he only had one bullet remaining. 
a voice spoke to him and said, pray first, aim high, and stay focused. However, at the same time, he saw a deer that he thought would be a better kill. Stay with me now. He brought the gun down to aim at the deer, but then he saw a rattlesnake between his legs about to bite him. So he naturally brought the gun down further in order to shoot the rattlesnake. Still, the voice said to him again, I said, pray, aim high, and stay focused. And so now there's a rattlesnake between his legs. There's a deer in his sights and a turkey way off. And so the man decided that he would pray. He aimed the gun high up in the tree. And he shot the wild turkey. The bullet bounced off the turkey and killed the deer. The handle fell off the gun and hit the snake in the head and killed it. And when the gun went off, it knocked him into the pond. When he stood up to look around, he had, a, he had fish in all his pockets. He had a dead deer and a turkey to eat for his family, all because he listened to God. You need to know this morning that even when God tells you to do something that doesn't make sense, you need to recognize that he's the God that invented common sense. So if he tells you to do something, quite naturally, it, 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 it's going to make sense because God told you to do it. Oh, when people talk, when people ask the question of the McKnight, who is the greatest running back of all time? Who is the GOAT running back? Many people of a certain generation with a certain flair will say the incomparable Jim Brown. I watched some of the clips. Jim Brown had good power, he had good speed, and he had elite vision. And, and many believe that Jim Brown was not only the, uh, uh, the greatest running back of all time, many believe he might have been the greatest football player of all time. But I got some issues with, 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 with Jim Brown because I, I never seen Jim Brown uh, 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 meet Ray Lewis in a hole. I, I, I never saw Jim Brown uh, 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 run through a Lawrence Taylor tackle. I, I just believe that, that Jim Brown was a good back, but he, he played in a weak era. Uh, some people say that, that, that the greatest running back of all time is Emmitt Smith because he got more yards than anybody else. But I need to let you know today that the offensive line that, that Emmitt Smith was running behind, uh, I could get 1,000 yards in a season right now running behind that line. Uh, so I can't put Emmitt up there. Uh, some say Eric Dickerson, and some say Adrian Peterson, and some even say the juice got loose. Uh, O.J. Simpson, I know you're mad at him, but the boy could run the ball. You see, all of these Hall of Fame players and, and potential GOAT running backs are a pale in comparison to a man from Oklahoma State University. His name is Barry Sanders. Uh, uh, Barry Sanders is never a runner uh, in the NFL like Barry Sanders. Uh, uh, one in a former NFL defensive player said, you got to watch Barry Sanders because he'll make you do the Lord's prayer on the field. Uh, uh, when he said that bear would run and you would try to go tackle him and he would juke you and you would go down like this, like he was praying to the Lord. Uh, Barry Sanders uh, could juke people like nobody else uh, but for all his juking and all his hesitation and all of his moves that made people look like a fool, Barry would never do anything to make you look like a fool after the play. Listen to me now. When Barry Sanders scored, his signature move was to throw the ball back to the ref. Barry Sanders didn't spike the ball. No dancing. No, no flipping. No taunting, no TikTok videos. Barry Sanders might have made you look like a fool during the play, but he never did anything to disrespect you before or after the play. Barry Sanders was a humble superstar. As scary as he was to tackle during the play, he was a gentleman before and after the play. Barry Sanders let his play do the talking. He let his skills do the woofing. He worked on his game, but not his image. He knew that if his game was his image would be right. 
So when Barry Sanders quit 10 years into his career, many were shocked. Most were befuddled, and some even called him a quitter. But unlike some Christians, Barry Sanders had been working on his craft and not on his image. So no matter what anyone said about his play on the field, reminded them of who he is. You see, most of us, we work on the exterior of our lives. We, we fix our hair. We fix our clothes. We clean our car. We polish our resume and our references, but we really don't work on the real self. I will contend with you this morning that most of us spend more time on our image than our reality. And the likely reason for that is because we want to look like we change, but we don't want to be changed. We want to look different, but we don't want to be different. It's easy to look like you have it together. Sometimes it's easy to put on a bad outfit. And sometimes it's easy to go get the car clean and put a fake background on your Zoom call, on your Facebook live post, or on your YouTube live page so that people can't really see the struggle that you're going through in your life. It's easier for us us to look like we got it going on and look like we got it going together instead of actually taking the time and intentionality and a strategic analysis that it's going to take for you to really deal with who you are. We are people who are preoccupied with our image. Hey, listen to me. How many times, how many times in the last 90 days have you flipped a picture of yourself and posted it on social media to see how many likes and comments you got. Don't put it, don't, don't put it in the, don't, don't, don't put it in the chat. Don't, don't tell on yourself. You see, when, how long does it take for something good to happen to you until you post it? You see, and Christian folks, we real slick about posting stuff that happened good to us. We know we don't want it to sound carnal. We don't want it to sound fleshly. So what we'll do is we'll post it and we'll say, God did it. We're trying to flex, but we put Jesus in the middle of the flex. You see, you see, saints, our image, saints, it's not just an exterior matter, but it is, it is an integrity issue because our image is not really who we are. Our image is simply a costume we wear when our integrity is too skimpy to cover our nakedness. But if you and I would represent a real God, we're going to have to be real people. If you and I were going to represent a God who can bring us from darkness to light, we got to look like and understand that we know what darkness and light is. If we're going to represent the Lord, we need to be people of integrity, not just people of image. To function in integrity does not mean to be perfect. It does not mean to be devoid of deficiency. It does not mean not to have any idiosyncrasies or weaknesses that occupy our personal space. It does not mean that we've arrived. It just means that we are honest about who we are what we are and where we are honesty is absolutely vital for us to represent the kingdom honesty is absolutely vital for us to get what God wants us to be for you cannot reach a real destination from an imaginary starting point in order to reach a real place you got to start from a real place and if there's anybody who can help us to understand what it means to be real is the Apostle Paul. You see, the aim of honesty is not perfection. The aim of honesty is authenticity. You see, Paul is a wonderful teacher about authenticity because this letter actually is penned to the Corinthian church. I'm giving you some background now. It is penned in such a way as he responds to the initial communication that has come to him. This is Corinthians chapter 2. So that means that was a Corinthians chapter 1, the Corinthians uh, uh, 1 that came before that. You need to understand now that the Corinthian church was situated uh, in Corinth, and Corinth is a major port city in Asia minor and yet there are Christians who've gathered there and come together to form a church to represent the movement of Christ. Stay with me now. I'm setting it up. You see there are young
young believers in this church. Uh, uh, there's, it's a changing environment. And consequently, they're looking to Paul to help them with strategy, to help them with philosophy and theology and practice of, and practical Christian principles to help them live like Christ in an unchrist like world. But that's why in 1 Corinthians, Paul tells them, don't eat food offered to idols. That's why in 1 Corinthians, Paul tells them and teaches them about not suing each other like pagans do. That's why Paul tells them what Christian marriage should look like and feel like and sound like. They get the letter. They appreciate what he said. But as many young Christians do, they got an attitude about to Paul about how he does things and how he carries himself and how he preaches and how he looks. Because, you know, people in the church today, they're real unspiritual and carnal. They decide where they're going to go to church based upon how the building looks. These people are very uncalled and spiritual today, and, and the Corinthians were. In other words, they begin to question who Paul was. They begin to question his apostolic authority and his ability to write and give them this kind of wisdom. They begin to talk behind his back and make fun of him and dog him. They say stuff like, you write wonderful letters, but you don't preach that good. We were, we were looking for someone who presented a better image. We were looking for someone who looked like a conference president. And when we heard about your sickly nature and you being persecuted from city to city, city to city, quite frankly, we were not really impressed with the image that you presented. And so Paul writes 2 Corinthians as a clapback to defend his apostolic authority. But check out how Paul does it. You see, most of us, when our reputation gets attacked, when our image is under assault, the first thing we want to do is defend ourselves. Come on now. Somebody start attacking your character and your personality. The first thing you do, you might not say it to them, but you say it to yourself. This, this Negro don't know who I am. Do you, know, do, do, do you know what my last name is? Do you know what my resume is? You, you're saying to yourself, how dare this person attacks my character? Do you, do, you, do you know where I went to school? You see, however, when Paul gets attacked, he does not defend himself. Instead, he says, let me show you the evidence that I have been called by God. Listen to me now. Because the evidence that I have been called by God is not my preaching. It's not in the giftedness and the anointing that you think I ought to have. The fact that God has called me. God has called me even though I'm jacked up and I'm messed up and God still wants to use me. It recognizes and helps me to understand that God has called me not because I'm gifted, but he called me because he chose me. When people attack your authority and your ability to stand in the place that you do, you need to let them know you are where you are, not because of your giftedness or your super anointedness. And despite the flaws that they see in you, it is because God looked beyond your faults and saw something messed up and said, I'm still going to get the best out of this messed up vessel. What the people who have been with God recognize is that the evidence that they've been called is not that they've got the right earthly qualification, but it comes because they got the right heavenly qualifications. Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 proceeds to present his case of witness integrity. You see, Paul gives us a motto of a humble superstar. You see, the definition of a humble superstar is someone who can stand in great places without taking God's credit. It's someone who's anointed but not arrogant. Someone who knows they are prominent because of God and not themselves. This is what Lucifer could not understand. You see, God shines the light. We can only reflect the light. And Paul conveys in these next verses there is that humility allows one to be honest about themselves and people are willing to connect with a humble testimony rather than a fake, fictitious, superficial lie in order to keep our image up. Paul in chapter 12 explains how he is qualified yet remains humble. And here is how he knows he is an apostle to the Gentiles. Here is how he knows he's a superstar among apostles yet humble among men. See, the first thing that, that Paul's ministry reveals about himself is that, first of all, he's blessed beyond merit. 
You see, if, 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 if you're going to be one of God's superstars, the first thing that you've got to recognize is, as God has blessed you beyond what you deserve. Listen to the text now. Listen to the text. You see, the good things that have happened to me are evidence that God has called me to do something beyond what my ordinary abilities would allow. He says, I don't deserve any of this. The reason I am who I am, the reason I move the way I move is because God has been good to me. Listen to the text. Paul says, I have experienced some events in my life I can't explain. Paul says, I've seen some stuff I can't explain. And nobody can relate because nobody has seen what I've seen and done what I was able to do. Paul says, listen now, I, I, one day I was caught up in the third heaven. I wasn't in the first heaven with Superman flying. I wasn't in the second heaven in space with the Green Lantern. I was in the, I, I was in the third heaven where the Lord was. And I saw some stuff. Uh, and, and I heard some stuff that I couldn't, that I couldn't figure out. And it was, it was so high. It was so lofty. I can't even explain it. Paul says, uh, I've been walking with God. And, and I've been communing with God. And fellowshipping with God. And God has done some things that are unexplainable. And even if I tried to tell you what he's done, you wouldn't believe it. If I tried to show you and, and, and accurately and, 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 and honestly convey the way that God has been gracious to me, you wouldn't believe me and you wouldn't understand. He says, there's some stuff that God has done in my life I can't explain. You see, you know that God has touched you when you know that your greatness has nothing to do with your greatness. And you respond to humi with humility. You watch verse 6. He says, I got a lot to brag about, but I won't do it. He says, I don't want anyone to think more highly of me than what they can see in my life and hear in my message. Paul said anything good that has happened to me, uh, 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 to have happened through me, was one, was God was the one who did it, and God is the one who gives credit. Paul says, if I get celebrated in any capacity, let it come from my life and not my lips. If you see something in me that will bless you, praise God for it, but I will not spend my time are uh, uh, lifting up my own reputation. I will not spend time glorifying my own achievements. Why? Because everything I know, God taught me. Everything, I've, everywhere I've been, God took me. Everything I have, God gave me. Everything I've been shown, God showed me. So let God get the glory. First thing you know, when God has touched you, is that you've been blessed beyond marriage. Let me tell you something. It's some folks that's listening to me on this live stream. You in a place you're not supposed to be. You somebody supervised, you're not supposed to be nobody supervisor. You ain't got no qualifications to be in the place that you are. The only qualification you got is the Holy Spirit put you there for a witness to his work and for a witness for his kingdom. And when you recognize and understand that you are where you are because God put you there, not because you qualified. You might be a superstar in your position, but you're humble about it because you know that God put you there and God can take you out. And so you're humble about what God does through you and in you. And you dare not take the credit because you know it's God and not you. So the first thing you really need to recognize if you want to be one of God's superstars is that you've been blessed beyond marriage. Here's the second thing, and this one's going to get a little bit more dicey. Paul says that I, I'm not burdened by burdens. I'm burdened by grace. Let me say it again. I'm not burdened by burdens. I'm burdened by grace. Let me unpack it. You look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. Let me unpack it. Watch Paul. He says, I'm blessed beyond merit. Then he says, he talks to the Corinthians. He says, I'm not burdened with cares. I'm burdened with grace. And this is interesting because usually cares uh, bring burdens and grace lifts burdens. But Paul intimates that he's not weighed down by burdens. He's weighed down by grace. Paul says that the good things in this life prove God cares for him, but the rough stuff in his life, the 
stuff that knocked him down, the stuff that humbled him is the evidence that not only God has been kind to him, but that God has been keeping him. Listen to me now. Paul says the blessings reveal his goodness even if the bad stuff, the challenges, and the stuff he don't want to talk about and go over again, the stuff that embarrasses him is that stuff that proves that God's grace is evident in his life. Listen to Paul teach about self-awareness. Listen to me now. I'm getting to the crux of this message. I'll be done in about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Here's what, here's what Paul understands. Paul says that God taught me something about myself I didn't even want to admit about myself. The Lord knew I needed something I didn't want. What did he, what did he need he didn't want? Paul says it was a thorn. Listen to me now. Paul said he didn't want it. He said if it was up to him, he would have turned it down. See, the Greek word for thorn is scallops. Scallops, listen to me now. Scallops is a pointed piece of wood, a pail, or a stake. It appears to indicate that some constant bodily ailment or infirmity, which even when Paul is caught up in a trance to the third heaven, he is sternly admonished by this thorn that he dwells in a frail and mortal body. The idea of pain seems suggested in the context of this thorn. You see, scholars note that the two chief options of scholops are, are, are either relational or physical. Listen to me now. By relational, it means that human opposition and persecution that followed Paul in his ministry and the physical, it means the illnesses and the disfigurement and the disability and moral temptation that constantly plagued the host. Paul dealt with relational issues by people deserting him in the church and people outside the church persecuting him. The definition denotes that a thorn for a believer can be a relationship, a constant painful temptation or a mental or physical condition which is likely in Paul's circumstance. A thorn can be a person or a physical sickness. A thorn can be a temptation to mishandle money or a constant problem of dating and marrying but never being able to hold on to anybody. The thorn can be a godly life with ungodly children. Paul says he needed it because it was going to help him later on. He said, I was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and to keep me from getting proud. Saint, uh, uh, Paul says that the thorn came from Satan, but God gave it. Oh, let me explain that. He said the thorn came from Satan, but God gave it. What we got to understand, saints, is this is it don't matter what the devil does, the devil is just an actor in the play. But God directed the play. What we got to understand is that no matter what the devil does, the devil has to get God's signature on, get God's signature in order to do something. In other words, the devil may do what he's going to do, but God is the one who is orchestrating things. God is the one who is behind the scenes, uh, making sure that nothing happens that he doesn't want to happen. God gave the thorn, but Satan delivered it. Satan is like DoorDash. A uh, 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 DoorDash don't cook the food, they just deliver the food. Paul says that the thorn was rough, that it was crazy. He hated it, and he wanted to get rid of it. But Paul said that his battle with the thorn showed him that God giving him the thorn was right. Listen to me now. Why? You see, the thorn came to buffet him and to torment him. The Greek word for buffet and torment means to strike. And what happens is in this, in this, this Greek word to, to strike is that it strikes the same place. You ever, you ever had a pain and you wish the pain, if it can't go away, you wish it moved somewhere else? You wish it, uh, if you've got a pain in your knee, you wish, well, could it, can it move down to my ankle for a little while, give my knee, give my knee a little rest? But see, the thorn that Paul, the, the thorn that Paul is speaking about, it doesn't give him any rest. It keeps on hitting him in the same place all the time. He never gets any rest in it. 
He never gets any, way, any break from it. You see, the thorn stays in the same spot over and over and over again. And just when he thinks he's over with, it shows up again. And just when he thinks he's outlived it, it shows up again. And just when he thinks that joker is out of his life, it shows up again. Listen to me now. This is the major point in this message today. The thorn battles and torments and buffets Paul. The Lord says, I gave it to you. Listen to me now. Because the purpose of the thorn was not to hurt you. The purpose of the thorn was really to expose what was underneath the surface that was going to kill you if you didn't have the thorn. Okay, I got to come down here. Y'all missed that. Y'all missed that. Y'all missed that. Here we go. I, I know it's spontaneous. I missed that. Let me tell you something. The thorn, the thorn is not there to kill you. The thorn is actually for your salvation. Because the thorn, because it torments you, it uncovers something in your character that you wouldn't know about unless you had the thorn. Paul says that Satan, that God through Satan had given me a thorn to buffet me because of my pride. Paul would not have been aware of his pride had he not had a thorn. And you would not be aware of the character trait that would cause you to be lost if God had not given you a thorn. Y'all ain't listening to me. You, you can listen to me. But here's the thing. You're going through the same thing over and over and over and over. You've been going through it for 20 years. You don't understand why. You want God to stop having you go through that. But I'm going to tell you today, the reason why you got that thorn in your life is because you got a character deficiency. You got a character flaw. And if it wasn't for the thorn, you would not even be aware that you had a problem. And that very thing would cause you to be lost. And it's God's grace that you got the thorn because it reveals something about you that would have caused you to be lost. The, the, the thorn is not to hurt you, but the thorn is to show you some grace. Listen to me. Paul said, I don't want that thorn. God sent it, and he used it to expose something. That was really a real problem. Paul said God sent the thorn to expose the fact he had pride. Because when the thorn showed up, he started asking, Lord, why me? Do you know who I am, Lord? I'm the one you call on the Damascus Road. I'm the one who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Why is this happening to me? But let me let you know something. Let me repeat again. The thorn is not going to kill you, but the thing that the thorn reveals will kill you. You see, the pride that you have will kill you. Let me let you understand something. The battle with the thorn actually exposed the pride that was underneath the surface of Paul's character. This is why, saints, listen to me. This is why godly people can have bad children. Some spiritual people can all always have money problems and faithful people might not find a suitable mate. You are Christ-like, but you're always sick and in and out the hospital. It's not that you are lacking or deficient in order to have these things, but there's something that God wants to expose and deal with that will kill your spirituality. Your loveless marriage will not kill you, but the selfishness that it exposes will. Your bankruptcy will not kill you, but your desire to always have more than anybody else will. Your bad knees will not kill you, but your competitive spirit, uh, it exposes will. The thorn is the thing that you hate is not going to kill you, but the character trait that you love, that is going to kill you. The thorn is about grace. So Paul said, I begged the Lord three times. Take it away. Take it away. Take it away. I want to deal with it. I want to deal with it. And the Lord said, look, I ain't taking it away. You need it. Do you want to know what power really is? Do you want to know? Power is ministering to somebody when you need ministry yourself. Ministry is helping somebody else when you're in dire need to help yourself. Ministry is helping keep two people together when won't nobody even take you on a first date. Real power is being able to put aside the things in your life that trouble you and help somebody else. 
You see, the thorn never leaves him. Why? Because Paul has an issue with pride until the day he dies. You see, but nothing, saints, neutralizes arrogance and narcissism and self-centeredness like a thorn. Nothing makes us reconsider who we really are but a thorn. Have you ever had a gift that, that when you used it, the person got what they needed? Have you ever had a gift? Have you ever had something that you did well that worked for everybody else but you? Everybody you pray for, God blesses them. You pray for yourself, you don't get nothing. You're a peacemaker. You, everywhere you go, you make peace. But you ain't got no peace in your own home. Have you ever had a gift or something that you did well that God used you to bless other people, but it didn't work for you? It didn't work for you. Paul said three times, I prayed, but God didn't take it. You see, you need the thorn as long as you're battling with your particular character issue. And the moment that you think that you've beaten your issue, you just lost. The moment that you think that you're no longer susceptible to the temptation of the moment, you have lost. You see, you see here, 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 here's what we do with, with God. We say, Lord, let, let me come down. I'm going to come down. I'm going to warn you. I'm going to come down here. See, see, here's what we do. Here's what we do. We start making deals with God. And say, I'm a, and say, I'm an old business guy. I'm just a business guy doing ministry. So I know what it is to make a deal. So you make a deal with God. He said, this, this, this is what we do, Sister Pride. We'll say, if you take this thorn away, I return, I, I, I return all my time. I'm talking about not the net, Lord, the gross. I return it. I, I, I do it. Lord, Lord, if you take this thorn away, I'll be at church every week. Lord, if you take this thorn away, I'll be online for Wednesday uh, uh, at 6.50 instead of 7 o'clock, waiting on them to start a prayer meeting. If, if you if you take this thorn away, uh, I'll serve you. i love you. And the Lord said, no, you won't, because if you love me, if you wanted to serve me, if you wanted to return, you would have done all those things without the thorn. But the only reason why you're asking for me to take the thorn away is so the only reason you're bargaining with me is because you want the thorn to go away and so what God says I'm not taking the thorn away from you I'm keeping the thorn on you because it's the only reason why you are doing what you're doing is because the thorn is in your life let me say something sometimes it's the thorn in your life the reason why you're so spiritual have you ever saw somebody and they were just a nice person but they had this one thing and this one person in their life, and you was thinking to yourself, Lord, why you let this really, really nice person deal with this really, really crazy person? Lord, why did they get, Lord, Lord, Lord why, why did you put these two people together? Why, why did you give them these kids? And you're thinking, Lord, this is such a nice person. If you would just take this away, they would be so happy. And the reality of it is, is the reason why they're such a nice person is because they got that crazy person in their life. And if they didn't have them, they be hell to deal with. The reality of it is, is what Paul began to do, saints, instead of fighting against his thorn, Paul started to embrace it. And the reality of it is, is that Paul's superpower was not his shadow healing people. Paul's superpower was not snakes biting him and him throwing them off. Paul's superpower was not dictating and writing two-thirds of the New Testament. Paul's superpower was his thorn because it allowed him to be able to do great things for God uh, without taking God's credit. You see, the Bible is full of people with thorns uh, that, that God made a humble superstars. Uh, if you don't believe me, let me name them out. Uh, Moses was a superstar pro uh, prophet with a speech in impediment for a thorn. Uh, Gideon was a superstar warrior uh, with a self-confidence as a thorn. Naaman was a superstar warrior with leprosy as a thorn. Rahab was a superstar revolutionary with a desire to belong as a thorn. Zacchaeus was a superstar tax man when his height was a thorn. Hosea was a superstar prophet with a cheating wife as his thorn. Eli was a superstar priest with ungodly sons as a thorn. 
Jacob was a mighty shepherd with disloyalty as a thorn. But unlike these, Jesus didn't have no thorns. The Bible says that the thorns, that Jesus took the thorns on the cross to save you. And he gave you a thorn in your life to sanctify you. Listen to me now. As the thorn was buried in Christ's head, the thorn that God gave you is buried in your life. Christ's thorn cleansed the world and your thorn purifies your heart. The only application that God takes for superstars are the ones that he can make humble. The only way that you can be a superstar with God is you got to get enough blessings to keep your hands raised and enough trials to keep your knees bent. Enough blessings where you will give God the credit and enough burdens where you will honor him and let folks know that without him you will be nothing. Enough blessings to enjoy life but enough burdens to go in life. Enough blessings to have mountain top experiences and enough burdens to keep, the, to keep it real in your life. Enough blessings to say God favors me and enough burdens to say he's keeping me. Enough blessings for the joy of the Lord to be in your heart and enough burdens to take the bougie out of you. You see enough blessings to be God's superstar but enough burdens to be his humble servant. See, God doesn't give people great power unless he can control their level of humility. And to the degree that you will be humble is to the degree that God will do something with you. And many of us, we want God to do something with us. We want to do something great. We want to do some of biblical proportions. But we can't even turn the cheek. We want God to, to, to help us to, to, to move a mountain like Moses. But we can't get over our stuttering speech. The reality of it is today is whatever thorn that you have in your life, whatever the thing in your life that dogs you all the time is the thing that God is trying to use to propel you to the greatest level of service and the greatest connection with him that you've ever had. God is trying to make you a superstar, but a humble one. God is trying to make you great in the kingdom of God, but keep you humble so that he won't, that he won't lose you. The reality is, saints, that unless our humility goes up, the church will never reach the level of productivity that it needs to finish the work. And so this, this, still this morning, why have you not attained the status that God has given? Look at Paul now. Look at Paul. Look at Paul. Look at him. He writes two-thirds of the New Testament. Not even Jesus' shadow healed people, but Paul's did. Jesus didn't write nothing in the New Testament. His words were dictated. Paul wrote almost the whole New Testament by himself. And yet he says, at the end of his ministry, he said, sinners of whom I am chief. Paul recognized that no matter what he does for God, it doesn't equate any merit to him. It equates grace that comes from God. And so today, God has great things for some people that are in South Park Circle. He got some great things for you. The reason why he hasn't brought it to you, the reason why you haven't achieved it, the reason why you are nowhere near getting it, it's because you're too proud. It's because you are too full of yourself. And the only way that you're ever going to reach the heights that God wants for you, you've got to start to look up instead of looking inward. Not your education. Not your looks. Not your bank account. Not your connections. Not your last name. It's the spirit of God today. So here's my appeal. Here's my first appeal. If you want to let 
the thorn that God has already put in your life. Do its perfect work. Just put in the comments today, Lord, let the thorn work on me. Just put in the comments, Lord, let the thorn work on me. Just put that in there. Just say, Lord, let the thorn work on me. What does that mean? That, what that means is, is you're going to stop fighting the thorn, you're going to start working with the thorn. What it means is, is that you're going to stop asking God to take it away. But you're going to ask God to take away the thing that the thorn reveals. That you're going to see the thorn not as something negative, but you're going to see it as a measure of God's grace. When you say, Lord, let the thorn do its work, what you're saying is, is that whatever the reason you sent the thorn, Lord, let me know and let me work with you so that the thing that the thorn reveals will not kill me. Stop your pride. Your selfishness. Your vainglorious self aggrandizement your desire to have more than everybody else, your, 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 your desire for, for, for material things over anything else, whatever it is, that well, your, your desire to, 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 to be preeminent and be number one, whatever it is that God is trying to work with you that will kill you, God is saying the thorn is there to help you deal with it. Let the thorn do its work. Let the thorn do its work. The example that I thought about, that I gave you all today about Barry Sanders. Barry Sanders has been asked several times, who do you think is the greatest running back of all time? He never says himself. Because whoever is the GOAT never says they're the GOAT. Because they let their work and their life and their accomplishments speak for themselves. So if you're a bad boy, you don't have to say it. If you're a bad girl, if you're doing your thing, you don't have to say it. It will be as evident and resonant to people. Here's my final appeal. There's someone here, you, 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 can, you can never reach the heights that God wants you to reach because you've not even humbled yourself to God in the first place. You, you, you pass through this live stream. Look, we're not the largest live stream on YouTube, so you get to our live stream. God got a message for you. He got something for you. Today, you are outside of God's kingdom. And right now, today, you need to come on the inside of God's kingdom. You need to say, Lord, come into my heart and make me the humble servant you want me to be. That's you today, and, and you just need to ask God to come into your heart just put, in the, just put in the comment section, Lord, save me. That's all you got to do. Say, Lord, save me. You, 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 have a great, you might have a great life, but you don't have Christ. And I'm going to tell you something. If you have a great life, but you don't have Christ, you have nothing. You have absolutely nothing. And so here's what you need to do. What you need to do is you need to say, Lord, save me. If that's you, you need you, and you said, Lord, save me, then what you need to do is, I don't care whether this is a rebroadcast, whether you're on right now, you need to email askthepastor7 at gmail.com. I need to connect with you. If you've done that, if you said, Lord, save me, because he's not in your life, you've not given your heart to him, you need to email askthepastor7 at gmail.com. You need to let me know. I want to reach out to you and to help you. There's some information that you need to know. There, there's some camaraderie. There's some fellowship that you need to walk this journey to being God's humble servant. May God bless you all today. God needs some humble superstars in this, in this arena. If today you'd like to give a, a, a loose offering, you know, you can give a loose offering. You, you've been blessed by today's message. You've been blessed by Sabbath school. You've been blessed by the singing. You've been blessed. If you have, then consider giving a, a, a gift, a token of your blessedness, on our cash app. It's right there on the screen. Just drop something in there and God will bless you. And God will bless you. Just drop something in there. May God bless you. May God keep you. May his face shine upon you. May the wind of spirit be at his back, at your back. We will see you by God's grace this coming up Wednesday at 7 o'clock for our online prayer service. Please be online or at least get your prayers, your prayer requests to our team. May God bless you. Thank you.